let's kick this off. So hi, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Elliot Harper, and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Digital Logic. We're a marketing services company um, based in Moravin at the moment, soon to change, um, and uh, we're also a marketing cloud partner. This is a session I delivered at Salesforce World Tour, was it last month, I think? Yeah. Um, and well, it's based off a, a presentation I delivered. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is, is loosely follow this. I've added a few slides, and I actually want to go and uh, jump in on occasion to Marketing Cloud and show you some uh, <clears throat> like uh, real-world examples. Um, but in the meantime, we'll just power through this deck. So uh, this is a 30-second resume slide. Um, as I said, I'm Chief Innovation Officer. I've got over four years' experience in Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Very active on Stack Exchange. So Stack Exchange is a great community to learn Marketing Cloud, where you can go and ask questions and, and get answers. And that's where, really, I've, I've learned so much in Marketing Cloud. I've learned, in part, through using the product, um, but also in hanging out daily on Stack Exchange and understanding what questions um, people have. And so I didn't know you could do that in Marketing Cloud. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really active there. Um, and you know, I co-organize um, the user group meetings with Matt. And uh, author of the um, best-selling book, Jenny Builder Developer's Guide, soon to be a major motion picture. They're making it into a movie. Um, it's going to be a major box office hit. Um, and I've uh, just got awarded Salesforce Most Valued Professional, so I'm really chuffed about that um, achievement. And I've got a couple of these uh, certified marketing cloud thingies um, from Salesforce. Uh, so I just want to firstly understand how many developers we have here by asking the question, why did the functions stop calling each other? Because they had constant arguments. So, and judging by, by that response, I'm guessing that not many of you um, are unnecessarily developers, but that's okay because essentially all a developer is is a, someone who can fix a problem that you don't know you have in a way that you don't understand. And thanks to Amscript, you too can uh, impress your friends at your next party with all your Amscript knowledge and everyone will think you're incredibly talented. You just need to understand what Amscript is and start using it. So. What is Amscript? Um, Amscript isn't a programming language, it's a scripting language. And it's a, a very easy to use language that follows a simple syntax that's primarily orientated to personalization. And so you can do things like, um, it, it's geared to, towards working with dynamic content, retrieving data, doing uh, string conversion uh, and transformation, you know, working with math and date calculations, System, system integration, and much more. And it works across email, mobile connect, mobile push, and cloud pages. Now, the objective of this um, short session is not I'm not going to teach you Amscript. You know, there are a number of tutorials available on Marketing Cloud Help, but I just want to go and call out um, some of the more powerful Amscript functions and explain what you can use them for. So, um, the first is uh, HTTP functions. Um, so these enable you to integrate and interact with content from third-party services. And there are, are really two core types of functions. You've got uh, HTTP GET that goes and retrieves content from a web page or an API, and uh, HTTP POST functions for interacting with APIs. And you know today, of course, there's an API for almost everything, you know, from the very useful to the very bizarre, including the Chuck Norris Fax API. Um, and, uh, you know, you can use these with uh, a Marketing Cloud. Um, so uh, a couple of, uh, one point I made here, it should be used efficiently. And when I say that, you know, if I'm sending an email and it's got a news feed, um, and you're sending that email to 100,000 recipients, but the news doesn't change, then don't go and make that request 100,000 times is inefficient. You would store that uh, perhaps in a data extension. Um, so use it efficiently. So uh, use cases. Um, so um, harvest content from external URLs like product information. So if you've got product information that's constantly changing, 
Um, and, uh, you know, rather than updating on your website and then statically in your email, um, uh, why not go and uh, get that from a, um, uh, from a CMS? Um, you know, we've used it for feeds on web pages and email, like having a, uh, a news feed for uh, no, one of our clients, a major sporting client, um, of, which shows all of the, the news related to um, the, the club that uh, they support. Um, could be a, a weather feed, perhaps based on a subscriber location, um, using things like uh, Google Charts, and they have an extensive API. You can have personalized maps and charts in email or cloud pages. Um, and uh, you know, a popular application is to have um, personalized shortened, li shortened links, particularly in uh, SMS messages, where maybe you want a shortened link to a personalized landing page, or maybe it's to a um, like a cloud page, a form uh, to go and fill out like a pre-populated form, which we'll be discussing shortly. Um, and there are various paid and hosted services um, enabling a shortened link. So Bitly is one of them. Um, just a, a word of caution on Bitly, I found out the hard way, um, is that you can't, there, there's rate limiting on the free version of, of Bitly. Um, so where I think you can only make like 100 requests a minute or something like that. Otherwise, you start to get rate limiting. Um, but if, you, if you're looking for a URL shortening, um, there are a number of options. Speak to me, there's a, like a free version you can go and host yourself, or you can you know, pay for these Bitly ones. I think they charge $280 a month, um, which uh, I thought was somewhat excessive, just for shortening links. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so you can certainly integrate those uh, using the HTTP script functions. So let's talk about API functions. Um, so within Marketing Cloud, there are 273 different SOAP API objects, which enable you to go and program programmatically replicate user functions. And most of these API methods are available um, from uh, AmScript functions. Um, so you've got uh, you know, these uh, invoke functions, which perform um, actions such as create, delete, execute, perform, retrieve, update, which is the majority of um, uh, actions used for uh, the, the SOAP API. And uh, you, know, you commonly go and use them in cloud pages. Notice that um, they're restricted from using at send time in an email. For example, I can't use the API function to get an email to send an email. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yes, I mean, we commonly go and use them in cloud pages just to, maybe we've got a custom preference center and we want to go and uh, update subscriber preferences and all subscribers, you know, they choose to opt out from receiving communications, for example. Um, so, you know, in addition to uh, the invoke API AmScript functions, there's also uh, a helpful function which falls under the API category in the documentation called raise error. And um, this is really a lesser known function, but enables you to um, either skip sending to a subscriber, or in fact skip sending the entire job, say you're doing a guided send, um, if uh, it meets a logical conditions. Uh, uh, sorry, meets a logical condition. So for example, if you don't receive a response that you expect from an HTTP function, like you get a 500 error back or something, then you can skip an email or emails from being sent. Um, and again, either just skipping that record or aborting all emails. Bear in mind um, that uh, you're still charged for a send. So don't use this raise error, only use the raise error function as this name implies if something goes wrong and you just, uh, um, rather than uh, um, the email returning a you know, 500 error, you know, enables you to go and catch that uh, and intervene. Um, if you want to skip sending to a subscriber um, based on something, uh, maybe something in the data, raise error isn't the right function to use because you're charged, right? If you want to skip sending to 2,000 people, then you'll still be charged for those uh, 2,000 emails. Um, 
So other um, uh, use cases for the API functions um, is you know, sending a triggered email from a cloud page. Very typically, I go and complete a form and is sending a, uh, a confirmation email to them um, for retrieving more than 2,000 rows from a data extension. So you, you may be familiar in AmScript, there's a lookup rows and variations of it, like lookup ordered rows and lookup ordered rows case sensitive. Um, but that will only return 2,000 rows from a data extension. Um, there's a lookup rows server-side JavaScript function, but that only returns 2,500 records. Um, so, uh, but you can use this to go and retrieve more than 2,000 records um, because it's essentially using the SOAP API. So we'll retrieve the first 2,500 records and then you'll get this message back of more data available and then you can go and retrieve the next, uh, just recursively go through that until you've uh, returned all those rows. Um, and you can do things like delete a, a row in a data extension you know, using API function, or things like, you know, retrieve all lists for a subscriber if you're using, like, a custom preference center or something. So, again, almost anything that you can do with a SOAP API, uh, you can do, um, it is available through these API functions. Salesforce functions. So, um, I love and hate Salesforce functions, and uh, um, I know, I love Salesforce functions, but they're but there's a kind of word of caution that um, I'll, I'll discuss uh, in a minute. So Salesforce functions enable you to interact with sales cloud objects. Now, obviously this um, assumes that you have installed the Salesforce connector um, and that your marketing cloud is linked to a, um, a, a Salesforce, a sales cloud uh, org account. Um, and there are a few uh, different functions. So you've got retrieve Salesforce ob objects. Um, doesn't, as the name implies, goes and retrieves objects. It actually retrieves um, a, a record set um, based on a criteria. Um, so it will go and uh, retrieve you know, um, uh, a row set, actually, uh, either a single row or you know, multiple rows. Um, then you've got create Salesforce object, as its name implies, it goes and, uh, and, and in fact, his name is also misleading, it doesn't create an object, it goes and creates a record um, in a sales cloud object. And then you've got update a uh, single Salesforce object, which updates an existing record in a sales cloud object. Um, so use cases uh, include like, maybe you want to update the campaign status you know, of a lead, or contact when they go to maybe a, um, a cloud page and, and completed their cloud page and maybe you want to convert them from uh, to actually a qualified contact from a lead. Um, if you want to go and uh, um, dynamically retrieve and personalize fields. Um, so for example, we, we built a custom preference center for one of our clients and uh, sales cloud is a single source of truth. And rather than replicating um, all of that, all of the uh, contact object in uh, a data extension, um, all we simply do is when they go and visit it, we go and retrieve all the fields and pre-populate um, the, the preference center form, you know, with uh, all of their contact information and everything, and if they go and update it, then it will go and use the update single Salesforce object to go and update those um, those fields for that row in that um, Salesforce object, um, and nothing is stored in Marketing Cloud. It's all um, uh, you know dynamically retrieving and updating Sales Cloud, and um, yeah. So just a kind of few examples how you can use it. Um, we're using this pretty extensively now, and uh, it's fairly robust. But that, here's that word of caution that uh, um, I mentioned earlier. So in, in Sales Cloud, um, you've got something called object lock contention. And, ah, uh, shit, okay, so object lock contention, um, what, what can actually happen, depending on the type of object, um, is that it will uh, place a, a level of lock contention of the object. So if I'm going and 
For example, we're using a um, create Salesforce object, update single Salesforce object, um, and there are um, uh, there are related fields to other objects um, in that object. Then it will um, I can kind of understand the reason for this temporarily lock that object to in a, uh, to disable any thing else going and updating any other record in that same object. Um, so normally this wouldn't be a problem, but where this does become a problem is when you're sending an email, and we're like, we've got a client, and we, when we go and send an email for each email, they want to go and uh, create a new record in a specific object. Um, so the problem is that um, essentially these functions are just, they're just a wrapper for um, the, the Sales Cloud REST API, and of course, Marketing Cloud is um, asynchronously going and sending several thousand emails at the same time, uh, and which, um, if there's a you know uh, a uh, related field in the object, then it's going to place a lock intention, and the email send fails um, because it prevents any other object from. Uh, sorry, a, a, any of these other um, uh, Salesforce function requests from a accessing that object, and that's a that's a kind of big problem. And it's, I mean, this is documented um, pretty extensively uh, once you find it, um, and said these are things to avoid. It happens with the Sales Cloud bulk API, um, and. Uh, there's no easy way around it. The only way that we've, how we're working around it is that um, rather than going and um, performing that function um, in the email, we go and uh, update a data extension and then have a, an automation to, to go and um, do this at a later stage. And I'll be showing, I'll be talking about how we're doing that. Um, by using claim rows and, uh, um, but yeah, so kind of word of caution, um, lock contention is going to get you into a lot of trouble. So uh, if you're using these functions when sending an email, you have to um, understand that there are data relationships in your object. Sorry, earlier. Yeah. What's, what are the conditions under which the lock Nikhil, maybe you can um, kind of enlighten you. So Nikhil, this is our, um, 12 times uh, sales, uh, Salesforce uh, certified guy. Um, remind me, the, so the, this, the condition is um, that... The object record that you are uh, communicating with in Salesforce, if it has a lookup relationship or any sort of relationship to some other object, then uh, any operation that, that you are... For, let's say, for example, you are doing these two objects, A and B in Salesforce, and you are currently uh, communicating with object A in Salesforce. And if A is related to B object, so whenever you are communicating with A, the corresponding record, re record B will get blocked so that no other operation in Salesforce or outside Salesforce can update the record B. So, so I've, yeah, for example. The re re record blocking condition, which is a you know, platform feature for Salesforce. Yeah. Sure. For maintaining the referential integrity of the object. Exactly, maintaining the uh, integrity. So, and I, I, I put something about this on Stack Exchange, explaining um, what the exact error is. You can see I'm creating Salesforce object here, and we get this um, message back. Or, in fact, we don't get a message back. We, you know, um, called up support, and they said um, that the AMP script's generating this following error. Um, you know, unable to lock row, unable to explain exclusive access to this record. And there's, um, I've created a, there's um, this cheat sheet for which it shows all uh, standard objects that employ a high risk of lock intention, record locking cheat sheet. So you can see risk low and high, <laughs> so these are standard objects to avoid. But um, it can happen in custom objects too. Um, so again, if you've got that relationship, then you're going to run into the same problem. And you know, there's, uh, this is kind of uh, explained pretty well on this. Um, engineering blog um, from Salesforce. So uh, yeah, just something to be aware of. Um, and uh, like there are workarounds, like um, uh, we're doing, but yeah, it's it was a kind of lot of hard work, and we uh, 
we found out the hard way. So just jump back into the presentation. And we'll wait for, here we go, fantastic. Um, so next, uh, Claim Row. Um, I only actually started using this a, a few weeks ago. I, I knew this function existed for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, I've actually found it a very useful use for it. Um, but what it essentially does is it locks an entire data extension row and prohibits anything else, the AMP script or, or something, from going and using it. Um, and until the, the, um, the row's claim status changes. And uh, optionally, you can go and insert a date time stamp when the row was claimed. So a typical use case for this um, is assigning coupon codes. And Adam Spriggs has uh, written a, a great um, article about this on his blog. Where uh, Imagine this use case where um, I've got several hundred coupon codes that I want to go and uh, make available to the first 500 people to go and sign up or, or something to, to get the discount. Um, and the way that it works is that it will go and um, uh, take you know, the first available um, coupon and then um, uh, immediately go and lock it and prevent anything else from using it. And then you can go and add um, a value in another column against that row. So um, perhaps it's better explained if we have a look at Adam's code uh, and his example he provided. So let me just, again, jump out of PowerPoint and go across to uh, AMP script claim row. I'll, so I'll talk you through what Adam's doing here. Um, Coupon claiming, here we go. So say coupon claiming is probably you know, the number one use case, and I'll, um, I'll talk about others. Um, so imagine we've got a, a data extension which simply looks like this. You can see this was created a few years ago, this, this, um, this post. You've got coupon code, email address, and is claimed. And we've already gone and pre-populated this data extension with a number of different coupon codes. Bear in mind that you want to have, ensure that you've got adequate coupon codes um, to you know, go and uh, kind of fulfill this. And then, uh, so he's gone and imported it. And then here's the actual, um, uh, in this case, um, so say this is on a cloud page. It is, a, uh, yeah, probably is a cloud page. So what he's doing here is first, um, he's going and getting the um, attribute value email address. So obviously this is in the context of Maybe you know the um, actually this is probably probably an email. Yeah, this is an email. Oh uh, no, no super coupon row claim row. Yeah, no, no, this will be an email. Yeah. So he's got, going to use uh, the email ADDR field um, in his sendable data extension, um, or in yeah, and then um, what is done? He's got his. Uh, um, data extension coupon codes and is looking to see whether there's um, a coupon assigned to that recipient um, and so if there is then it's going to go and return one row so what we're saying here is if the row count you know, is greater than zero um, then uh, you know, there is already a coupon code assigned to that subscriber and so it's going to go and set the coupon code to that value and it's going to print it down the bottom Here's your coupon code because they already have one, right? Um, but you know, else if and, and also note what Adam's done. You can tell us an email because it's message context. Um, you don't want to go and assign coupon codes to people when you're previewing an email. So here's why he's putting this conditional statement here. Um, uh, but uh, so if there isn't a coupon code for that email, what it will do is it goes and uses this claim row function to go and use that coupon codes data extension. And then there's this is claimed um, field. So this is a, you can call it what you want. Um, I think I'll call it claim status or something in mine. Um, but this has to be a Boolean field. Um, and what it will do is to, um, this is used for locking the row. So it will change the value to true and then prevent any others from using it. And then the other one is this is going to go and uh, the other parameter you're passing here is um, 
a, a name value pair of the, the field you want to update. So in this case, is assigning uh, the email to the email address field. Um, in my case, I'm doing something else. And optionally, you can have a, um, uh, a claim date. If you specifically call a field, this is the only time I've ever seen it, if you name a field called claim date, it will magically go and populate it with a claim date. Um, so, um, and then, yeah, it's going to go and uh, say, here's your coupon code. Um, otherwise, you know, the email is going to raise an error. Raise error! There it is! Hey! No more coupons available. Um, and interesting enough, on raise error here, um, this is a, um, a custom error message. Um, but there's no way for you to go and see these custom error messages without you calling up support. Uh, so, uh, I just that's a bit frustrating. I had a chat with the MScript development team a couple of weeks ago and I raised this and said this is just a really frustrating feature. Um, so maybe we'll see that change. Oh, and interestingly enough, um, because the claim row is returning a row set, then you can go and use fields from that row set to get other shit. So let's go and take a look at an example, another use case here. Um, so what I'm doing, and this is a, a way that I use to overcome the, uh, this, the lock contention on Salesforce objects, is that um, I generate a, a reconciliation report of all of these um, records I need to create in Salesforce and uh, um, have them in this reconciliation report. And what, what happens here is that it will, uh, I've got a server-side JavaScript running in a script activity to go and return um, the first unclaimed row um, and uh, goes and uh, um, claims that row, goes and um, puts the subscriber key um, again in that subscriber field in the data extension and does lots of other stuff. But notice that I'm setting a service ID. So also in this reconciliation report, I've got a field called service ID and it just works the same as lookup rows does. So I'm getting the uh, field called service ID from that reconciliation report um, from the claim row function. So, you know, I've got the, you know, my claim row variable there and I'm just getting it from there. So, um, yeah, that's kind of handy to use. Um, that's claim row. So, uh, yeah, check it out. It does have use, as I found, um, uh, other than assigning coupon codes. <laughs> Cloud Pages URL. This is this is my favorite, and this is kind of thanks to Angel uh, at Kathmandu. I kind of discovered this undocumented feature, and I had a on my call like a couple of weeks ago with the AmScript development team and documentation team. I said your documentation A is completely wrong, <laughs> um, and the example that you've given is just a really really bad example, uh, and they fixed it up, but. They still got an error in the documentation. So if you follow the documentation, it's going to raise an error because they haven't closed off an inline AMP script tag. But like whatever, I, I'm just I, I I give up on them. Um, but uh, so and it's it's somewhat more clearer now, but it's still not what I asked for, and it still doesn't explain what I'm just about to tell you. So listen in, and we're going to show an example of this. This is really cool. Um, so. What a Cloud Pages URL function enables you to do is um, link to a Cloud Page landing page based on that numeric identifier in, um, in the Cloud Page landing page. It can only be used with Cloud Page landing pages, not with resource files such as you know, JSON or text or CSS or others. It has to be um, a type of a landing page. Um, and it passes URL parameters in an uh, encrypted string um, and it passes the subscriber key and email address by default. What do you mean by that, Elliot? Well, kind of seeing is believing. This is like really cool. Um, uh, so particularly when you, you, you know, you're using this in conjunction, using a, a cloud page URL from, um, from an email and in this Kathmandu's case, it's about preference center. But it could be anything. It could be like pre-populating the form. So um, let's jump across to uh, huh? window. 
Here we go. Um, uh, so uh, here's an email I created earlier. Um, oh, in fact, let's go. Here's a cloud page I created earlier. Um, let's go and look at that cloud page. Uh, and I'll show you a, a top tip for those of you who, were, who weren't here um, in the last session. Um, I use our, our old friend HTTP get here. Um, uh, so this tweet is content HTTP get function. So um, as you you may be familiar with when um, developing, when building, um, particularly when building AMP script for cloud pages or emails, if you get an error, you have to go back, you, you go make the change. In the context of an email, you, you know, you'll go back, you'll go make the change, you'll go and um, then go and click preview again, you go and select your sendable data extension, you go and select a subscriber, preview, another error, and go back, and it's just a frustrating loop. It's even more frustrating with cloud pages because this is published to you know, the Akamai CDN. It can take up to five minutes for your changes uh, to be published. So what I did was simply go and use a, a publicly accessible um, URL. I put all my code in this publicly accessible URL and then just go and call that. And so any changes I, I make is completely dynamic. So I'm using the HTTP GET, I'm calling a Dropbox link here. Um, so the way it works is, let's start from scratch just to show you. So, you know, so um, you're using just in, inline AMP script. Um, and then uh, treat as content because you want it, uh, you've got AMP script and then you want um, uh, the content to be treated as a content area, right? So this essentially does the same thing. Then you do HTTP get and now you're going to put in your cloud page URL, sorry, you're going to put in your, um, your external URL in there. And I use Dropbox. You can use anything. Uh, I use Dropbox really for convenience because it's free, and um, uh, you know I can simply save the document um, on. Uh, so, like here it is, for example. Let me go and. Uh, is this no? Gosh, that's, that's Captain Do. Sorry. Oops. Uh, so, um, so uh, I, I simply go and save that document on my computer, and when I do, um, we've got. Um, a link generated here. So this is a publicly accessible link. But notice if I go and view this link, it's going to come up in this uh, default Dropbox preview thing, which I don't really want. But if I go and remove www and change that to dl and remove this parameter on the end, it's going to show me the actual raw file. Oh, there's the Kathmandu one. What was I doing? Uh, so I picked up the wrong one. Cloud page URL. There we go, please. Copy link. Um, so let me try that one here. dl and move this here, and there it is. Um, so this is kind of the, the raw um, code. So uh, you know, what we'll do is we'll go and put that in um, in here, HTTP GET, obviously in quotation marks, and, uh, and schedule and publish. And um, as we'll see in a minute, any changes that I'm going to make will be immediately reflected on the page saves me hours each week. I mean, it's just absolute lifesaver. So um, let's go and take a look at that code. So what I've got, I'm getting the um, underscore subscriber key, which is the AMP script personalization string to go and show the subscriber key, and email ADDR, which is the email address. Um, and if we go and look at the published page, um, we're going to click on the link there, you'll see that, um, lo and behold, they're empty, right? Because uh, I didn't know who the subscriber is. Aha! But if we go to the email, and I've done a similar thing here using my old HTTP GET uh, function um, to go and uh, preview a subscriber. Let's go and pick a baby from the all subscribers list. Come on, you can do it. Um, I might need to, to reload this page because I did this when I before I left the office and I don't think I've reloaded the page. So, oh no, yeah, here we go. Um, so let me go and select uh, yeah Simon Sausage, um, and it should go and what am I doing? Subscriber, okay that preview. Let's try that again. All subscribers, Sam Susan Sample. 
and select. Here it goes. It's coming up empty um, at the moment. What was I doing? Oh yes, because we haven't gone and built the email. Duh. So let's go and have a look. Here's the email, right? Um, so at the moment, yeah, you're not really seeing too much in here. But I'll, sh I'll show you the magic if I go and type hello. Um, and now I'll go into next recipient. Oh, I'm going to have to wait for um, have to wait for the uh, unscript thing to the cloud page to be updated. There he goes. Hello, noise. So um, what we want to do though is um, let's put in our cloud page uh, link. So I'm going to go and um, put some AmScript in here. I'm going to put an AmScript block, um, and uh, we're going to write say var URL, declare the variable, and set uh, URL as um, equals. Um, as just. <laughs> Uh, I was looking for the number, I'll just go 117, wasn't it? Was it 117? Yeah, 117. So a uh, cloud pages URL 117. And then, of course, in my email, I can go and um, put, you know, uh, P uh, A equals, and then I'll put redirect to um, the URL. Does anyone know why I'm using redirect to in here? Does everyone know why I'm using redirect to as an inline AMP script there? Um, because uh, this is just best practice. Um, if you don't have that redirect to function, then it won't work. Link tracking won't work So uh, with AMP script, so don't ask me. Um, uh, link to my cloud page, and then uh, close that, and then close P. Okay, so save that. So now um, we'll just wait for that to synchronize. Um, come on, you can do it. There we go. And I'm going to go and click next. Link to my cloud page. There we go. So and again, immediately updated. So let's go and click on that link to the cloud page, and notice this query string here. Um, and and it's picked up the subscriber key and email address, right? Um, and uh, it's, uh, you got this for free in the encrypted query string. Now, the, the, the hilarious thing is that in the Cloud Pages uh, URL documentation for AmScript, um, they you can optionally go and pass through a parameter, and they're passing through a sub the subscriber key as a parameter. So why would you do that? You get the subscriber key for free. So why are you passing as an additional parameter? Um, so, oh, yeah, good point. Okay, so they've removed that now and replaced it with something that doesn't work. Oh, one of the other thing that wasn't documented, and I think it is now, is that you can pass multiple additional name value pairs. Um, so let's say, um, for example, in my email, um, I want to go and pass the cloud pages URL. You can put in a comma here, and then you can do like a F name and then comma, I'm just going to hard code some value, right? So normally you pull them from a data extension, and then uh, maybe uh, L name, and then um, a Harper. And so these are, are passed as um, URL parameters, even though but they're part of an encrypted stream, right? So people can't see it. And this is just such a beautiful way of um, ensuring that um, no uh, personally identifiable information is compromised. I don't want to be passing emails and stuff in a string. And before, I used to hack it and base64 encode it and then decode it, which is a really lousy way of doing it. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is kind of, we'll uh, encode those. So on my cloud page, um, if I go and add um, a, uh, a, a couple of others, so um, let's go and say I'm getting a request parameter um, and then uh, f name and l name so let's do first name how am I going for time Matt? you're going to have to cut me off okay 
Okay, cool. So um, here, you know, I've um, uh, th think of it. I'm passing additional URL parameters to my page, um, and uh, we go and go and click uh, next now. And go and click on this link here. Uh, you know, I think maybe I'd, uh, let me just go and click on the next record. Maybe it didn't synchronize. Loading up the link to my cloud page. Oh, there we go, Ellie Harbour. So it's passed those across. And notice that um, then they're in there somewhere, right? So it's kind of uh, uses uh, uh, symmetric encryption. Um, and yeah, there's no way that's uh, obtainable. It's really cool. Uh, and you can have multiple in there. Um, you can pass an entire form if you wanted to, but you probably wouldn't. Um, so uh, anyway, Cloud Pages URL, check it out. Awesome. All right. Um, Is the same function the end of the day called to kind of make suited parameters? Um, so talk me through that. OK, so in order to capture, or where is the response coming from, right? So I use my Google Analytics tracking, UGM campaign, UGM source. Yeah. So other parameters. So basically, those are exclusive parameters. Oh, so you're passing that on. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question because the thing is that um, this is all done server side, and that's those uh, Google UM, uh, those Google parameters are actually um, are used by the um, your Google Analytics collect code, the JavaScript. So I doubt that would work. What you'd have to do is um, something like uh, this, where you'd have a Cloud Pages URL, and you do concat Cloud Pages URL, and then, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, all, all, all the other parameters in there. And because those parameters would be um, then in turn um, appended to the query string uh, on the end of here. Um, if you see on media, yeah, okay. So let's uh, keep on moving then. Um, exclusion scripts. So I am the exclusion script master. I've devoted the past seven months of my career to exclusion scripts, and I'm doing things with exclusion scripts that um, surprise myself every day and um, dumbfound the AmScript development team saying, why are you doing that? It shouldn't work, but you know, it, it does. So I, I won't give away the crown jewels, but needless to say, they're, they're kind of really powerful. Um, and particularly when you start abusing them like I, I'm doing. Um, so exclusion scripts enable you to dynamically um, suppress sending an email to a subscriber at send time um, using AmScript. And it's available both in Content Builder, in Journey Builder, and now in Triggered Sends and, and Automation Studio. Um, so, oh gosh, here we go. They all pop up. So you can see in Content Builder, um, not classic content, but uh, Content Builder, you've got exclusion scripts. I've highlighted the panel there. Um, Journey Builder, it appears there. Um, triggered Send, it's there. Um, the Journey Builder email activity is a triggered send, so you see them in both places. And now in, in Automation Studio, using exclusion scripts. So, um, <coughs> What it does is it, um, it's a simple one-line AmScript expression that needs to evaluate to true to go and suppress sending to a subscriber. Now, it ha notice there has to be a single AmScript line. You can't ins include AmScript blocks. So here are some scenarios um, of, um, of where you could use, how you could use uh, exclusion scripts. So again, in that field, you'll paste the following code. Where I've got the first one is um, it's counting the number of customer orders for a specific subscriber that's being sent to, and if they've um, ordered, um, if they've got less than five orders, like they're not a valued VIP customer, then it's going to skip sending the email. And it doesn't count towards a send, unlike Ray's error, right? Um, the other one, typically, maybe I've got my, um, my sendable data extension, I've got a field called consent, uh, and if it doesn't uh, have a value, like it's empty, then maybe they haven't consented to uh, receiving the email. So, um, you know, this will skip sending the email again. Um, and it's, uh, again, this is just done in the context of 
descendable data extension. So notice I'm using personalization screen like underscore subscriber key or email address. They're all available um, in the context of uh, sending the email to the recipient. The other one, um, this is a bit of a funny one. This is, um, you saw in the last slide, domain exclusion. This is reverse domain exclusion. So I'm saying where um, if the email address contains the, uses the domain, company.com, um, then it will only send to them. If it's not company.com, then it won't send to them. So, you know, maybe I just want to make sure I only send to Kathmandu staff, for example, and uh, I can put this in, and if it doesn't match that domain, then it won't send to them. Um, so typical use cases include maybe you want to suppress sending an email if it was passed in the, sent in the past three or four days. Um, maybe it's suppressing sending based on uh, a, a frequency preference that the subscriber said, I want to only receive emails every four or five days. Um, or you know, maybe it's data in a data extension or attribute, such as I showed earlier with the um, attribute value example. Any questions on exclusion scripts? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we do the same thing uh, for in the journey with the exclusion script. Yeah. So that you know when email is sent, they get excluded. But the problem is, you know, it still identifies. It it doesn't break from there. It goes through the email sent. Email is not sent, but you know it goes to the next activity. Yes. Which could be a campaign. So yes. We typically send an email, then add them to a Salesforce campaign and change their status. So what happens is, you know, it goes through this email sent. It's excluded, that means they didn't receive an email, and it treats it as like it's done. It jumps to the next activity, which is the campaign, and it creates a Salesforce record saying that you know it's part of that email campaign. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so they carry on moving through the journey, of course. Um, but what you want them to do is to eject them from the journey, do you? Yeah, so if we are excluding them, you know, what should be when it flow to the next stage? You know, ideally, it should be stopped there, right? Okay. Well, I, I can show you how to do that using an exclusion script. You can, you can cheat and use an exclusion script to go and uh, maybe update a, a field in an a attribute set or data extension that exists in your contact model, um, and then either use a decision split or set that as the exit criteria in the goal, so they'll exit out of that. But you can do all that in exclusion script. So in the same script, we can add that as a correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. i have yeah, doing some. Uh, I'll I'll show you after. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry. Uh, can you also differentiate between marketing emails and the uh, notification emails? So the same just click on the email. Can you differentiate between marketing emails and notification triggering so, or based on, but how would I know what's a marketing email and notification email? Based on the subject or the name or? Uh, based on the type of email. Send classification. Based on the send classification. I, I don't think, and we'll have a look, I, I, I might be wrong, um, whether send classification is available as an unscript personalization stream. Um, there are tons of them, so if it is, then we can. Uh, so let's go and have a look at script personalization stream. And I'll tell you. Uh, and uh, this is the one we want. This is completely wrong. That page is completely wrong, so to pay no attention to that. Um, so, uh, because this is completely wrong, because it shows you um, use these personalization strings in conjunction with Mobile Connect and Contact Builder applications. That's wrong. They're, these are not personalization strings in Mobile Connect. Try them if you want. I can assure you they don't work. These, this is the uh, mobile address data view fields. This has nothing to do with it. I've got no idea. Um, you, you can try this the cows come home. It's not going to work. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, gosh, you've got to love them. Um, but uh, data about this sender. Group Connect microsites now. Let me go back up. Then by the uh, data about the recipient who won't be in there. Message type preference, data source name, pre-header job ID is test send, reply message, uh, message content, email name. Mm, no, it's not looking too hopeful. No, it doesn't do the, um, you can't go and get, uh, unless you've got some, you know, specific naming conventions for your, for your emails or if, you know, uh, either you, 
there's the email name or the subject, or there's something in there that says, you know, this is a um, transactional one, yeah. a notification one. If you name your email, so notification underscore or something, then you can do it. Um, but yeah, other than that, yeah, it looks like you're out of luck there. Um, anyway, okay, so I uh, just wanted to uh, finish off then um, just with a summary slide. So um, my number one tip is code for resilience. You know, your AmScript code can and probably will contain bugs. And, uh, um, you know, it's impossible to go through every single permutation um, before you go and send it. So you really want to increase the level of fitness of your code by coding for resilience and in turn reduce that bug surface area. Um, so use attribute value. Um, so I showed you use attribute value, an example of attribute value. Attribute value is used um, in preference over personalization strings. So you know that you've got, say I've got a field of my uh, sendable data extension called first name. And you might do percentage, percentage, first name, percentage, percentage. That's fine. But if you go and later use a different data extension and that field isn't available, your email's gonna error. Um, if you're using attribute value and it doesn't exist, then it just returns no, it won't error. Um, so it's just a uh, best practice. Um, check the status code of HTTP post functions. And this isn't documented either. But if you go and um, set an HTTP post function as a variable, then you can go and um, check the status code to see whether that, um, that request was successful. So in this case, I'll have something like, you know, uh, set uh, at post request equals HTTP post something, something, something. Um, and then later on in my code, I, I go in, I've got an if statement. So if post request is not 200, uh, HTTP status code back, then go and do something, like maybe raise an error, right? Um, uh, the other thing I touched on, don't use HTTP get unnecessarily you know, if you're always retrieving the same content, it's just very inefficient. Um, and uh, another thing um, is that, uh, well, you know, lookup function is very popular. If you're always retrieving, um, uh, if you're always using the same data extension and retrieving different fields from it, use a row set instead. I mean, that's what it's there for, rather than, you know, I, I, I look at the code I wrote two years, three years ago, and have a look. What was I thinking? Why did I write it like that? Even the code I wrote last week. <laughs> anyway, um, where you know I'd have um, lookup rows. Sorry, I'd have lookup data extension name, and then you know the column one to return, and then the the, the value um, uh, to match against. And so you you got like four parameters in there, and I have twenty of these, kind of all the same data extensions. Like, you know, no, just just use, just uh, go to look up rows and then just use field to, to go and return it. It's just a much more efficient way. And also, um, if you have, as I found out, you know, hundreds of lookup functions, it's going potentially, it's slow. It has a performance impact and can result in timeout issues. But lookup rows is a lot faster. Thank you. Okay, we got there. Are there any questions?